Welcome to Fright Fix. My name's Sook, and I'm joined by my co-host Celia, the Freddy to my Jason. <laughs> Hi everyone, and thanks for joining us. So every month we're delving into the twisted world behind the screen of our favourite horror movies. How you doing, Sook? I'm good, Celia. I'm really, really glad we're doing this, but I must admit I'm a little bit nervous. How are you? I'm really excited. I mean, this is our first podcast episode and we do have such a good film to discuss. I couldn't agree more. So basically, guys, Celia and I have a shared interest in horror movies and we love talking about them at work. So it only made sense that we started a podcast. Absolutely. It was the only thing we could do. So you can find your Fright Fix anywhere you listen to podcasts and follow us on social media at Fright Fix Podcast. This month, we watched the 2012 film adaptation of Susan Hill's The Woman in Black, starring Daniel Radcliffe as Arthur Kipps and directed by James Watkins, and has been adapted for screen by Jane Goldman, whose previous work includes the film adaptations of Kick-Ass and the Kingsman series. I'm going to give a little spoiler warning, as we will be discussing the film all the way to the end. So if you haven't seen it, go watch the film and come back to our podcast later. We'll be waiting. Thanks, Celia. And I'd also like to add a 1989 TV miniseries also exists. However, for this episode, we're going to solely be focusing on the 2012 film version. So a quick rundown of the film. A young solicitor, Arthur Kipps, is tasked with sorting out the affairs of Alice Drablo in the remote village of Crithen Gifford, who's recently died. When he arrives, he finds Eelmarsh House is haunted by the figure of a woman in black, a vengeful spirit of a woman who lost her son. Every time she is seen, a child dies. Arthur races to save his own son from her grip, but ultimately fails to do so. So Celia, what were your overall thoughts on the film? I mean, this film is really close to my heart. I've loved this film since the first time I saw it. Um, I'm also a bit of a uh, literature lover, so I did love the book as well. And I was really excited to see this when I first saw it. Um, Not many films give me the chills that The Woman in Black does. I think because she's just such an ominous presence. You know, The Woman in Black, I can see her out of my window after I watch the film and she's creeping (laughs) behind me in the dark and I just find it, you know, the films that can do that for me, I I have to say that I enjoy them. Um, And also the kind of Victorian Edwardian kind of overplayed, but in this film was done really well. That sort of era really creeps me out. So again, love that sort of thing. (laughs) What about you? What, what, what did you think of the film? Um, Well, I enjoyed it. It's a, it's a brilliant example of how much horror and ghost stories have evolved since the early eighties. I can, I can totally imagine this being terrifying uh, back then, especially considering the move, the the original book was uh, made in the early '80s. I think this film will scare people that aren't into horror films, and will definitely leave a lasting impression. But I think die-hard horror enthusiasts mm. might find it a walk in the park. Mm. Uh, Yeah, and uh, I can see how this film would seem very tame in comparison to modern day horror movies. Uh, There's far less emphasis on shock factor. I felt it was more of a slow burning uh, period mystery story. Yeah, but still, still very, very intriguing. I agree. I think that um, for me, because I quite like slow burning horror films. Yeah, modern ones don't do the do the same kind of you're trying to figure out why she's doing this. You know, it's all that mystery around why she is the way she is. And I think there are some techniques that they use in the film that I haven't seen in other places um, or are done differently. So, you know, the uh, catching a glimpse in the mirror as and you don't know she's there until she moves. You know, that's done quite a lot now. But just the way they did it in this film, I think. It, it did send shivers down my spine. And yeah, I thought that was, uh, you know, it, anything that makes me scared, I get happy about, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you uh, pay the price of admission for, right? So uh, Exactly, it's, it's exactly. Clear, it's, clearly it's not worth job. it. It's not <laughs> worth it if I don't get scared. So um, what did you think of the acting and casting choices? Do you think they did well in that that area? Right, well... That's a very, very good question. Now, I really like Daniel Radcliffe as an actor, and uh, I was never a fan of him in the Harry Potter movies. I was, oh, Mm. actually, 
I was never a fan of the Harry Potter movies, but I was a fan <laughs> of his of his chemistry with uh, Ron and Hermione. I thought they were a nice little trio, considering how young they were. Mm. So seeing him take on a role like this was fantastic. It's something probably a bit more meatier and a bit more mature. Yeah. But but there, there is a but. I couldn't quite shake off the fact that I felt he was too young for this role. And um, there's yeah. a part of me that feels that he may have taken on this role about 10 years too early. Mm. I just found him to be very boyish and at moments I felt like is that stubble just makeup <laughs> oh I'm so glad you said that because I, I thought I was going to come with something controversial and say <laughs> that I'm not sure about him for this role I do think this was his kind of breakout I'm not Harry Potter I can do dark I can do mysterious um but the character's supposed to have gone through so much by the time he's got to to Il Marsh House. You know, he's he's supposed to have lost his wife. He's supposed to be a father to a young kid. And I just didn't see Daniel Radcliffe as that person. I didn't see him, you know, I, I wanted crow's feet. I wanted, you know, <laughs> bags under his eyes because he's gone through so much. And that would have sold to me that he really is grieving for his wife. I think that's the main thing I picked up was the absolutely he's feel that and he's, yeah it was his is his boyishness he is still young he's too cute and young he is for, too for, cute yeah uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> even though this movie was made near on well released near on nine years ago I think mm. oh just nine years ago wow yeah, he still should kind have, of uh, think of it as a modern film yeah maybe he should re- maybe they should remake the movie now with <laughs> the age yeah. he is now <laughs> yeah I think um. They did really well with the casting overall. Um, I I think that every character bought what they needed to in terms of um, the closed off villages. You know, they they worked really well. Um, it was only Daniel Radcliffe being too young for me that was an issue uh, that I saw kind of throughout the film. But yeah, that's that's it's funny that you picked up on that as well. No, no, absolutely. I'm glad we're in agreement. I mean, other than Daniel Radcliffe, I didn't really recognize anybody else uh he was definitely the star of the show for me Mm. and uh yeah no 100% agreement very boyish maybe a bit too young uh no doubt he has the acting chops but I feel Mm. like he may have been miscast in this role yeah definitely yeah Cecilia did you have a a favorite scene or a scene that you liked Uh, I always go back to what scared me the most because that's the most enjoyable one scene that I really really enjoyed was when the rocking chair is rocking and we see that quite a few times and the first time I saw it I thought oh here we go trope of um haunted Victorian houses as a rocking chair yep and you think right it's going to be the same thing again you're going to get this rocking chair and it's going to go back and forward back and forward and then something's going to pop out which did happen but what I loved was while he walks up to the rocking chair in one of the scenes the camera comes from above and I was I thought it was quite strange because they didn't do any sort of bird's eye camera views in any other scenes it was just this one as he walked up to the the rocking chair and like I realized crane shot or something yeah some sort of crane shot and I realized well like what I took from that was that because the woman in black had um jumped from the rocking chair to hang herself you were looking at it from her point of view oh. you were looking at it from above I didn't even click yeah and I thought that that was just just that instant and if, if you're watching it for the second time because they, they explain that a bit later and I think if you're watching it for a second time like like I was you might pick up on that and you say ah oh, right you're actually seeing it from from her and then um as well as that the same scene the rocking chair kind of you know you think of it as the maternal rocking of a of a baby while they're sitting on on the lap of a, a mother right but then you find out that it's rocking as a result of her jumping off it to hang herself so it, oh, it kind dear. of subverts why the chair's rocking in the first place and makes it really disturbing. It's not just that general historical uh, horror trope that we've seen so many times. So that element I really liked. Oh my goodness, you're sending shivers down my spine right now just thinking about <laughs> that. I can't believe I missed that. I think because there were, were a period of about seven years in between my viewings, mm. if I'd watched it Im- immediately back to back uh, in one mm. sitting... Or maybe in the in the course of a week, I probably would have picked up on that stuff. But wow, mm. now you say it, you kind of blown my mind a little bit. It's quite a, <laughs> it's quite in, in, amazing how much thought they put into these uh, individual mm. shots. Um, no, well spotted. Ah, thank you. Did you um? <laughs> did you have a favorite scene? Yes, I actually had. I'm cheating now, but I actually had two that I liked. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, 
Now, my first favorite scene is actually the very first scene in the movie. Mm. And that's when, so I didn't really know what I was getting into when I watched this movie the first time. Yeah. And you just have this creepy, what sounds like a children's nursery rhyme or something playing. And Mm. you're in this uh, bedroom, clearly Mm. a children's bedroom. And uh, there's three young girls playing and Mm. this spooky nursery rhymes playing. And Mm. suddenly they stare off at something in the distance, not in the distance, (laughs) but kind of just beyond the camera. Yeah. (laughs) And then in unison, all three of them stare at that window. And they yeah. get up, they walk towards it, and you're like, and I was just Ooh. thinking, oh no, what's going They're on? They're gonna here? stop. They're gonna stop at some point, right? <laughs> no, no, okay. <laughs> no, without thinking twice. Mm. They ju- all three of them in unison jump out that window and uh, had uh, flashbacks to that bit in um Game of Thrones where uh there's a little yeah. Tomlin or whatever his name is uh, jumps out the window. But anyway, that goes, scene, mm. like that scene, that's when I was like, okay, I'm sold. I want to know what happens. <laughs> so next. two seconds in, you were like, "Yep, yeah, I'm in." <laughs> Doesn't matter what else happens. I'm sorry. No, absolutely, no, that, that, it, it was brilliant, wasn't it? It was I just think. masterfully put together. Absolutely. There's something so creepy about. Um, I I feel like I get so deep about all the scenes, but the way that they stand on their dolls that they were just playing with, you know, they yes. crush the heads of their dolls, and you think something's their innocence is gone and that something's changed from that one look behind them to looking out the window nothing matters to them anymore and it's just so yeah powerful absolutely and the first they have joy in their eyes and suddenly they Mm. have these vacant stares like there is nothing in there anymore yeah oh yeah my uh (laughs) funnily enough my next favorite scene was actually the very end scene (laughs) of the movie (laughs) nice wrap up (laughs) And it was the bit where, uh, you know, you think everything's over, the heroes have, you know, completed Mm. their mission, but no, Daniel Radcliffe's character and his son are at the train station saying their goodbyes. Mm. But then Daniel Radcliffe's own son Mm. has that same, that very same vacant stare as the girls at the beginning. Yeah. And he begins, nope. And that's it. Not even the heroes Mm. are safe in this. Little boy jumps on the train tracks. Daniel Radcliffe Mm. jumps after him and, uh, I love that the scene was so drawn out and it was drawn out mm. enough where it just allowed me to absorb what was going on. And yeah, and it was also nice that this uh, this movie had a different ending to the, the 1989 remake and the book. So, and the book, uh, yeah. I mean, though the, the results were just as tragic, but uh, mm. it's nice to have a, a, a different twist on the ending. Absolutely. I think that long drawn outness, it, you know, you're questioning, has she gone? Yeah, she's gone, right? nothing's going to happen to them because they're leaving. Hmm. Nope. This and seems then... very long. <laughs> Something's about to happen. It just yeah. keeps you kind of <laughs> in that that moment of like, oh God, has, has it worked? Yeah, yeah. and uh, and there's always a part of you that thinks um, that, no, the hero's going to survive. The hero's obviously is the hero. He's going to win. Survive. He's going to survive. Yeah. But nope, he doesn't. He gets hit by the train, him and his poor kid. And then as the train flies by in the reflection of the window mm. of the train you see all the the dead children and then mm. for a split second suddenly just the screaming of the the woman in black yeah that and scream then, just penetrates everything doesn't it absolutely it's piercing absolutely yeah. right <laughs> just I, I can hear it now <laughs> uh, well I know we've kind of said what we love about the film but is there anything you didn't like about it now I'm probably being very nitpicky okay but the entire film felt like a high budget BBC drama rather than mm. like a theatrical feature film for me. Okay. It, it all felt very kind of like small in scale. And uh, and I, and uh, yeah, I couldn't quite put my finger on what it was. I don't know if it was just the aspect ratio of the, the lenses used or the, or the, yeah. the film or, or whatever the technical term is. And uh, there weren't very many kind of like sweeping vistas. Everything felt very BBC to me. Set like, yeah, everything's on a set. Yeah, a little mm. bit like that. And I couldn't quite put my finger on it. But that was um, that was one thing I didn't like. The other thing was mm. uh, probably would make the entire movie black and white. Wow, yeah. And uh, so I kind of like snipped out a little portion of the movie and threw it in a video editing software and kind of like took the color out, edited it. Then I applied some uh, grain to it and it looked yeah. just a very very minute grain and very minute dust and turn the contrast up a bit and the film just looks 
so much more atmospheric really yeah i felt so and uh, i mean th- i mean most of the movie has muted colors anyway so it does mm. so taking away the color didn't really matter so much but i just felt like it looked making it looked a bit more old timey yeah. um yeah i mean i would call that particular version of the movie the woman in black and white but oh I don't know. Oh, oh sick that's oh. brilliant <laughs> that's, that's my dad joke of the episode <laughs> oh that's that's amazing I, that's so interesting i i think you picked up on something that i didn't realize i didn't like i was trying to figure out what it was and i thought that it was kind of a caricature of what a haunted house would be because of the way the eel marsh house is with the set the props in the set and the yeah. cobwebs and the creepy paintings and the dark corridors right doors can work really well but there is an element of it feeling quite staged almost uh yes. to a point where it's it's kind of making fun of the haunted house victorian haunted house because it plays sure. so much into it arthur kipps must be the bravest man in the world because he doesn't seem very scared ever <laughs> and i have to be honest if i was in that house with that woman and there was a, a you know dead child knocking on the door and there were footprints everywhere, and I kept seeing her, I would be a bit more scared than he was. <laughs> and there were sections where I thought, come on, just give a little bit more to it. Just just completely give over to the fact that this is supposed to be the scariest thing that's ever happened to anybody ever. And that's the only thing I probably would have changed because I never felt scared for Arthur. Yeah. I always felt scared for me because I was watching it. <laughs> and so, you know, it was, I, I got the jump scares and everything, but it's... I think that's the only thing that I wanted a bit more from. And I don't want it to go too far because I do get quite annoyed with films where they're too scared. I'm a very hard person to please. (laughs) (laughs) But it's the balance that you need to get to, which is that you show enough emotion that people start to connect with you and think, what would I do in that situation? But not too much that you think, oh, come on now, pull yourself together and do something about it. (laughs) (laughs) And I think he was a bit too far down the kind of, other end of the spectrum if I'm not I'm not that scared no no it would have been yeah just kind of humanizing him a bit more would have been uh yeah it, it helps the audience connect and I think maybe maybe just a scene or or something before he went to the house maybe something explaining that maybe there's incentive for him to just do this quickly and be out of there quick yeah. or, or maybe something like He's done this a hundred times before. This doesn't phase him. He's not like your, he's not your usual lawyer guy or something. Mm. I don't know. Maybe something. Yeah. And that goes back maybe to the casting as well, that he doesn't look like he's done this so many times. He looks like it's the first job he's ever had because he's so young. If this was an old weathered lawyer who, like you said, done it, seen it a thousand times, just wants to get in and out, you know, there would be that element of, he might have gone to a thousand creepy houses before. We don't know. But he seems too young to have done that. He seems to just be starting out. And well, I don't think of lawyers as ghostbusters. I don't think they come across ghosts very often, but he would have come across more. He would have had more life experience. Potentially, he's a bit older. Well, it's time for the part that I've been looking forward to the most. Celia, I'd Mm. love to hear your deeper thoughts on the movie's themes. Thanks, Sook. Okay, I'm I'm really excited to do this, but I have chosen quite a heavy topic to start with, I think. Uh, for our first episode but I think it's something that as I was watching the film it was the thing that kept jumping out at me and either I'm reading way too much into the film or it was intentionally done this way and I'd love to know if you picked up on some of the stuff that I did or if and if you think that that's what the film is is trying to say um but I think one of the main themes in The Woman in Black is the power of holding on to grief and how the inability to let go of it causes the destruction of the characters. I think the film taps into the really natural human instinct to keep the memories of loved ones alive. We we all do it, but it subverts it into something quite toxic and horrifying. It's the inability to let go of grief that gives the woman in black power. And it's only the ones who can move on that will survive. So there's a difference between this kind of toxic grief of somebody who is completely all consumed by it. And then there are characters who have been able to deal with loss and been able to live their lives alongside grief. And it's not saying that it's better to not think about grief or to, to get rid of it. It's more of showing the destruction that can happen if you ca- if you hold on to all of these negative emotions. Um, and it, yeah, it, it kind of 
it says something about us. It says something about us as humans as, as to how we deal with situations and that the woman in black, she represents a lot more than just a ghost. She, she represents vengeful feelings that you can keep within yourself and it only becomes toxic and destructive. Even though Susan Hill wrote this book in the 80s, she set it in Edwardian, late Victorian era for a reason. And I thought that the context that the film's set in is quite important to realise why this grief is so big for the characters. Um, so for the first time in history, people were living longer because medicine was improving. Quality of life for the kind of middle class was getting better. So dying young was much more tragic than it used to be. And I'm not saying that it was, you know, better in the olden days before um, the, the Victorian Edwardian era. It was just that it became more of how we feel about losing someone young now as a kind of a stealing of life. You know, they they had much more of their life to live. In the medieval times, you know, you'd have 10 children and two would survive. That was the way of the world. But things are changing as we develop and adult, as our medicine gets better. And the Victorians were obsessed with death. You know, this whole woman in black in the veil and the dress, that was real. You know, people had mourning periods. They had dress codes for how to mourn. It was all structured. And grief became this massive thing that was all consuming. And I think this context is why grief is such a powerful force in the film. And it's why that it gives the woman in black power. She's tapping into that Victorian fascination with mourning and she's holding on to that grief. And it shows how you know negative that can be. Um, and I suppose clearly the, the, the biggest symbol of that is Jeanette, the woman in black and her son, Nathaniel, their relationship shows this power of negative grief from the start you know clearly Jeanette can't let go of her son and her grief is what ties her to Eelmarsh house so just just to remind us that uh, Jeanette was uh, sectioned by her sister um, and her sister then looked after her son that uh, Jeanette's son Nathaniel while she was away and he drowned in the marshes uh, of Eelmarsh house before Jeanette could tell him that she was his mother um, because she'd been separated him for so long and she'd been told not to tell him that she was his mother. And that drove her to ultimately commit suicide. And you can see clearly that's grief. Of course she would be um, tied to the house because of this. But Arthur makes this a lot worse and he doesn't mean to, but he does make this emotion way worse. He helps her hold on to that grief rather than helping her move on from the death of her son and that for me that's why he ends up dying as well because he thought he was doing the right thing but he wasn't he was doing the opposite so I think there's two main main scenes that show how he's helping her keep keep hold of all this negative emotion the first time is when he sees the apparition of her son climbing out of the marshes and walking to the house and you know that awful like knocking and rattling of the door and that for me, was a symbol of letting her son back into her life, letting her son back in. And he decides to open the door. And whatever reason he had for that, he kind of metaphorically and literally lets it back inside, lets all that grief come back to the woman in black. And I think that gives her more power because her power is grief. Her power is that danger that she gets, that dangerous emotion she gets. Um, so I think that and then obviously the next time where he actually gets the body of her son and lays it to rest in the bed and arranges the birthday cards and all the little trinkets around him. Again, bringing all the memories back, bringing all the emotion back to Jeanette or the woman in black. Um, and that's, for me, that was why she was so loud and angry. Because in that scene was the first time we'd seen her in a kind of full anger, screaming, coming towards him there was so much power just after Arthur had laid her son down and so I was trying to figure out well why is she so angry right now surely the other emotion could have been here's my son I'm so glad to see him there's there's calm there's gentle emotions but clearly the opposite happened and then she's kind of whispering never forget never forget as as they think that they've sorted out her you know let her move on and it just shows that she can't let go there's, there's Arthur will pay the ultimate price for bringing her back to her grief. Yeah, the, so the woman in black or any ghost is uh, in a movie like this is like it's kind of like the personification of our fears. 
Yeah. And the, the, and I suppose any good horror movie antagonist is usually more than a monster or a ghost, but mm. yeah, normally uh, relates to the fears we have as humans, whether it be the lo- loss, grief in this mm. in this movie, or whether it's the uh, going through puberty or sexual awakening yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. It's normally related in some kind of tenuous way or some kind of i think that's what makes a, a really good horror villain if, it, if it's related directly to a very human experience and I, I just loved how you picked up on that absolutely i i 100 agree i i did my dissertation on that i did about <laughs> film monsters and the reason we love them so much is that they they represent something in ourselves and like you said you would never be able to get a proper connection with a random monster that had no human connection there was nothing about them you know that that's that's an animal basically you know you could be chased by a bear in a film and that would be kind of scary for your life but it wouldn't creep you out because the bear wouldn't be stalking you and no quietly coming into your house and you know it wouldn't do anything human the woman in black kind of if, if you take it from that angle of grief it teaches us that there is a little woman in black that lives inside all of us this kind of <laughs> having to hold on to all this negative emotion and and we have to exercise her from ourselves <laughs> you know we have yes. to tell ourselves that we need to be able to deal with these really negative emotions in a healthy way otherwise you know we're gonna be not <laughs> not the woman in black but <laughs> we are gonna be <laughs> unhappy because of it and so maybe there's a moral to the story maybe we're supposed to be able to deal with with grief in a healthy way to not end up as a vengeful spirit there's there's almost a mirroring and i didn't know if you saw this of kind of the woman in white versus the woman in black um throughout the film So just like the woman in black can't let go of the death of her son, Arthur can't let go of the death of his wife, who is, for me, the woman in white. And I think the reason that they're depicted as black and white is the black version represents, like I said at the beginning, grief as vengeful and destructive. And then the white shows grief as sadness and it's but it's a peaceful feeling of, you know, you're grieving, but it's not angry. You're grieving because you've lost someone and you get these memories of this person, but it's not destructive to your life. So they mirror each other in a lot of ways. And I think the reason that they do that is to show that grief can be seen in in those two lights as either destructive or as just very, very sad. You know, it can just be mourning. So at the beginning, when Arthur, he's looking in the mirror and he's shaving And his wife is talking to him behind him. And and we don't know at that point that she's dead. But then he turns around and there's no one there. That's not a scary scene at all. But the same thing happens later on with the woman in black. Um, You see her gliding past a mirror. And I think she does it a few times in the hallway where you just catch a glimpse of her in the mirror. But that's really scary because it's like, oh, it's the woman in black and she represents everything that we're scared of. But they're doing the same thing. It's just the difference between what they represent and how they embody themselves as something peaceful versus something destructive that makes them different. And another example of their mirroring is the first time that he sees the woman in black fully is through the window and she's standing near the graveyard of Eel Marsh House and she's in her full funeral attire, And, you know, he just thinks he's seen a woman and he has to go and tell the police about it. But, you know, he sees his wife in a flashback in a graveyard wearing all white and she's wearing a veil. But it's not scary. She turns around and she walks away. And it's, again, the difference between someone who's just grieving someone and remembering their kind of who they are uh, versus somebody who represents something so terrible and makes him you know, fear for, you know, have to have to run back to the village and, and tell them that there's a woman. Um, oh. I think it's a bit more flimsy, but the woman in white, she appears out of nowhere in flashbacks throughout the film. She comes to his memory, just like the memory of, of, a, of a lost loved one would do. But it does come out of nowhere. And it's the same as the woman in black. She just appears out of nowhere. But again, the difference is the woman in white, we're not scared when we get those flashbacks. We are when we see the woman in black. There's a difference. Um, And I think, yeah, what makes them light and dark is the nature of their death. So Arthur's wife dies in childbirth. And 
although that is terrible, it was something that happened quite a lot in the Victorian and Edwardian era. Whereas Jeanette's son died in a violent and horrific way in the marshes. And the grief that's felt there is different. So Arthur is kind of mourning in a peaceful way, whereas the woman in black is mourning in a in a terrible way. Um, but I, it would be interesting to know what you think about, because you talked about the ending being one of your favourite scenes. And what I really liked about it is all the way through the film, these two versions of grief were mirroring each other and then they kind of come together at the end because when Arthur and his son are dead and they're not they don't know they're dead yet the son says daddy who's that lady looking over his shoulder and you could either think I mean I thought it was the woman in black because that's who we've been talking about this whole film that's who has been yeah and but then you find out it's his wife and so they've kind of become one character by the end um showing that it's two sides of the same coin. Um, and I just thought that was a really good way of ending it, was that you can bring these two emotions together because they do represent you know, the same thing. With movies, I find, is they will introduce an image that is quite powerful mm. fairly earlier on in the movie. And then later on in a film, uh, sometimes that image is kind of reflected in a, in a weird kind of way or a, or a way mm. that the audience doesn't necessarily expect. And it's mm. like these, uh, so like the mirroring you're, you're talking about, or you mentioned is, uh, it's like this kind of visual poetry almost. Yeah. Like, uh, it's like they're two lines that rhyme with each other. Mm. In a, in yeah. A different kind of way. And I find, I find that really fascinating that you picked up on that. And uh, it's, it's, it, it's yeah it's it's fascinating like there is like a the, the, I don't know like a witch and a godmother type yeah it is it's yeah. it's the good and evil it's the the evil witch versus the good witch um yeah. of but it was also I think a choice of the film to do that because in the book at, you know the the wife doesn't die at the beginning she dies at the end yeah yeah and so it was their choice to decide that she was dead the whole time and I think the reason well my reasoning as to why she's dead the whole time is so she can mirror the woman in black and they become they're both ghosts in a sense um one's more you know in the real world as the woman in black than than his wife but they they are both dead and they both show loss and mourning in very different ways I, I I suppose that that is another thing that I would have loved to see because I love the end of the book because you think you you have a lot longer and if if anybody doesn't know the end of of the book I'm about to spoil it um <laughs> it so Arthur's wife isn't dead at the in the book no, they're um, happily married aren't they happily married having a good time yeah. she, he gets back to London after thinking that he had uh exercised the woman in black and she'd gone so he goes back to his normal life with his wife and his young child having a great time they go to a fair um and her his wife and son go on a i think it was a horse and cart ride or or something like that where they're yeah by a horse and cart and as they're trotting along arthur sees the woman in black coming out of nowhere and it scares the horse and the horse runs into a tree i think and kills the son and the and the mother. So the same thing kind of happens. Uh, it's just different people dying. But essentially, you think that the woman in black's gone. She comes back. She's not gone. You're dead. Same thing kind of happens in the film, but it's him and his son. And so there's a reason why they've chosen to do the son and the father dying with the mother already being dead versus what happens in the book. But I did love the book because <laughs> it's that it's. It's what we were saying before about, oh, it's fine. It's definitely over. Oh, it's is it over? But very drawn out because yes, yeah, you've got yeah. longer to... Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's strange because if this if this same movie came out about 30 years ago, this like in present day horror movies, what happens so frequently is the adventure's over. Yeah. And then right at the last minute, the ghost or the monster appears dun, dun, for one dun. last one last scare. <laughs> and it, it would be easy to say like, Oh yeah, the woman in black did it first, and in a long drawn out mm. kind of way. But mm. what, what, where I felt like uh, it was a bit tame by today's standards is they kind of it, it felt a bit tropey, kind of like or modern day audiences have probably seen something like that happen quite a lot, where the, the villain comes back for one last strike right at the very end of the movie. But 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 then here, yeah, I, I suppose I had to remind myself that hey, this is this is based on a book. This isn't based mm. on uh yeah. So you have to kind of honor the book in a in a creative kind of way. It's, uh, it's nice to see it being a a steam train rather than a, a horse and carriage. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Wow, you've picked up on so much there. There's a uh, I love. <laughs> I just love how uh, how you picked up on so like 
on such a just multi-level multi-faceted uh movie like it's like there's a there's the story and then mm-hmm. there's the story as it's displayed on screen by mm-hmm. the actors and performed and then you know if you're an eagle-eyed viewer you pick up on how <laughs> you know the, the film subtly visualizes themes using visual metaphors and whatnot it's- That was lovely. I really, really enjoyed that. It's uh, it's deep, <laughs> but I think it, yeah, it's it's an interesting, an interesting one to look at. Right. I think I've done enough talking. <laughs> I think my voice is <laughs> is leaving me. Um, I am really excited to know what you've picked up in terms of production notes and trivia. So I'm going to pass it over to you, and we'll see what you've got. Oh man! Now, one thing I love more than watching a movie is the is just the interesting tidbits that you uh, that you find out in the trivia section or just like uh, scouring the wikipedia pages or the making of documentaries now uh, firstly this was mentioned earlier on but this was daniel radcliffe's first uh, movie at the end of his Harry Potter run and just like what a role to pick it's uh, it's quite a contrast and uh, i don't know part of me was thinking maybe it's a uh, it was an attempt to shake off the boy wizard persona. He, you know, he did do that for mm. about 10 years. And uh, I think it was a good move, you know, to maybe the, the first step on the road to uh, prevent him from becoming typecast. And, uh, yeah, 10 years is a long time to, uh, you know, be be Harry Potter, especially in the, the public's consciousness. So yeah. I thought that was quite interesting. Now, here's one that I didn't pick up on until at the end of the movie. But bes- despite the film being named The Woman in Black, the script or the end credits never, ever... Ref- uh, refer to her as the woman in black it's always a really always always Jeanette yeah Hmm. I wonder why I suppose it's not her name so (laughs) (laughs) uh... (laughs) yeah so Arthur's son a little Joseph Kipps is actually played by Daniel Radcliffe's real life godson really yeah I have no idea that's so nice (laughs) (laughs) yeah I think it was at his request and uh, it would explain why they had a a very natural chemistry Mm. so uh, yeah yeah, so, uh, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And the uh, the film was uh, considered to be shot in three D at one point, uh, but thankfully that was abandoned. Oh uh, God, do you uh, remember three D? <laughs> that was it didn't seem to last very long. Man, that was during that uh, post uh, Avatar three uh, D boom when yeah. everything was converted to three D. Did you ever watch any three D horror movies back then? It no, but I'm pretty sure it was Coraline. I think Coraline was 3D. That, that I had the 3D Blu-ray of that, and yeah. uh, it came with like little uh, those little anaglyph glasses with the red and blue. Yeah. <laughs> that was really scary because <laughs> I, I find Coraline so scary, but that's the only one I can think of that I remember being slightly horror related. That oh was, yeah, that's um, a, definitely a creepy movie. It, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't think it was made by Tim Burton. But it felt very Tim Burton-ish. Oh, a hundred percent, yeah. So, uh, so some of the locations are actually uh, real locations. So, um, Cotterstock Hall uh, in Northamptonshire was used uh, as the exteriors of the house, and uh, mm. I might be pronouncing this wrong, but oh, I want to say O'Shea or O.C. Island was used as a Nine Lives Causeway in right. in uh, in this movie, and also uh, in the nineteen eighty nine movie. And uh, well, I suppose it's quite a specific set to try and find, isn't it? Uh, a remote uh, island that is cut off from the tide. <laughs> no, I can't imagine there's very many like that at all. And I think it's based. Yeah. I think it's uh, out in Essex somewhere. Right. I was yeah. You know, I was wondering because the house when you first see it looks really real from the outside. So I was thinking whether it was real or not, or if because I was thinking if that's a a set, that's really good. No, I know, um, but <laughs> it's real. Yeah, it's real. And uh, because of the changing in the tides, they could only shoot like for four hours at a time, which is must have been an absolute nightmare. Oh. Probably takes four hours to set up in the morning, <laughs> and then you have to back it all up and go home. Oh, oh I think so. Yeah. And uh, now this is a bit of an odd one. So despite being a despite being a horror movie, uh, the distributor, which is uh, mm. Momentum Pictures, aimed for a twelve A rating, which really? I believe, yeah, which I believe in the US is the equivalent of a PG thirteen. 
so they uh, so sadly about there's about six seconds of footage that were cut out of this movie and uh some of the scenes had to be like visually darkened so the brightness was reduced i don't know in my opinion like when you're making a horror movie like aiming for anything lower than like a 15 rating is kind of like asking for trouble in, in my opinion uh, yeah because you're being restricted aren't you by what you can do. I, I completely get it for a film that has maybe one or two elements that would push it over to a 15, so you might as well not put them in because it will make it 13. But like you said, if it's cutting out sections of the film or darkening it, it just, is that worth it? I don't know. Well, I don't think it was because uh, even though they tried to uh, try to avoid uh, that high rating, uh, the high age rating, they still did get in trouble. Because uh, mm. <laughs> the year this movie came out, the BBFC, which uh, the BBFC, basically the guys that rate movies, right, received 134 letters of complaint saying that the rating of 12A was too low. Really? <laughs> yeah. At, you know, I remember the first time I saw the film, and I my parents were quite strict about the types of films I was allowed to watch, and it, you know, it, it, they would stick to the ratings. And I remember halfway through the film, my dad going. This isn't a 12. This isn't a PG-13. <laughs> we shouldn't be watching this. I was like, it is. It definitely is. And he took the, the case out and was looking at it. And I was like, no, it's, it's, it's a 15. <laughs> oh, you, you had parents that actually cared. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so yeah. That was nice. oh, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, it definitely wasn't that case in my, my house when I was growing up. But, but in regards to the complaints, it was actually the most... Uh, complaints for a movie the bbfc uh, released that uh released received that yeah wow and was it all the horror it was all the, the fact it was too scary yeah rather I think, than the, yeah. The, the things they were dealing with in terms of I, children i'm not 100 percent sure to be honest but uh mm. i i would i can only assume it's probably related to the horror elements and maybe uh, youngsters not being able to cope because i remember uh watching the 1989 uh, woman in black in school when I was about 11 or something and that terrified the hell out of me and I don't know mm. who that I mean that was a tv series and uh so it probably didn't have an age rating against it I, I mean I presume but that made me hesitate to watch this version of the movie because I thought if that traumatized yeah. me as a child this one would probably screw me up even over screw me yeah. up even more than uh than, than the previous one yeah, but but so this uh, film was uh, also re-released in 2014 and uh, given a limited uh, release, re-release, right? Uh, in the run-up to its sequel, The Angel of Death, which uh, was uh, given a 15 rating. <laughs> oh, it was. <laughs> yeah. Have you seen that one? I didn't. I I vaguely recall that it existed, and uh, whilst I was researching this movie, uh, I yeah. was reminded that it. It existed. I totally forgot. Did you? Did you ever watch it? No, I, I've never seen it either. And exactly the same thing happened to me when I was—I I don't know—looking for the cast or something. And it came up, and I thought, well, it can't. I mean, the woman in black would be the same character, but I mean, the other characters are dead, so it must be a completely new um, cast and story for there to be a sequel. But part of my brain feels like it's seen it, but I can't remember any of it. I'm sure if I started <laughs> watching it again, I'll remember, but it clearly yeah. can't have been that good because I don't remember it. <laughs> no, no, I don't think it did too well. But uh, yeah, I remember the, seeing the posters for it on the trains, on the tra in the train stations rather. But you didn't see the woman in black out the window while you were on that train? Oh, no, I think she was sitting next to me. <laughs> <laughs> that time, that time of night in London, there's loads of uh, loads of them on the train. <laughs> oh. But that one did get a 15 rating. Yes. So they learned their lesson. Oh, absolutely. And, and tried not to get it. Yeah. I, I, I get it from a kind of consumer point of view, but sometimes it's not worth it. <laughs> yeah, I just don't see the point when they make an. If you're going to make an action movie, just give it an adult rating, or if a horror yeah. movie, just give it an adult rating. Leave the kids' yeah. movies to. To Pixar be kids' movies. The... Yes, and that's why exactly. there were so many complaints because it clearly wasn't a kids' movie. Yeah, and absolutely. if you've got parents like mine who go off <laughs> the age ranges <laughs> and they will let you watch anything in that age range, they're not going to be very happy. <laughs> no, no, no. So Adrian Rawlins uh, played Daniel Radcliffe's character in the 1989 version of uh, The Woman in Black, mm -hmm. um, which is a, a weird coincidence because he played Harry Potter's father in the Harry Potter movies. Did he? Oh, Weird. what a nice uh, <laughs> reunion. It's not over that many years since they probably met on set of Harry Potter. Uh, oh. Well, no, because he wasn't in it, but a weird kind of, yeah, cycle, Hollywood yeah. cycle. Another Harry Potter link 
uh, Kieran Hines, who played Sam Daly, is also Dumbledore in Deathly Hallows 2. No. Really? Uh, apparently so. Oh, yeah. Young Dumbledore. Yeah, yes. Young <laughs> I was yeah. trying to figure out how he is. <laughs> yeah, because I think Michael Gambon played uh, old Dumbledore. Yeah, I was going to say, have I just completely missed the mark? <laughs> is there a new one? <laughs> Oh. Well, there were well, there was Richard Harris who played Dumbledore in the first couple of movies yeah, before he yeah. passed away. So, um, God, so uh, poor Daniel Radcliffe trying to get away from Harry Potter, and no. he just went straight into a film with with two strong connections. To, to... The thing is, during those early two thousands, pretty much every British actor working either worked on Lord of the Rings or worked on True. the Harry Potter movie. So. It, yeah. He ain't going to escape him. <laughs> He's not going anywhere, especially as Harry Potter. No, um, no. <laughs> yeah. So the original ending was Arthur and Joseph getting hit by a train, and that was it. It cut to black. However, test audience didn't uh, like the scene and found it a bit too bleak. So filmmakers went back and filmed that afterlife scene uh, afterwards, uh, where Arthur is reunited with his dead wife. And uh, I don't know about you, but personally, I found this scene to be at the time before I'd heard your explanation <laughs> I'd found the scene to be quite sickly sweet and I didn't yeah. like it at all and um, I personally would have been okay with that bleak ending of when it just when they just die and it just ends but to be honest with you after I heard your conversation about mirroring I'm starting to have second thoughts now maybe it wasn't such a bad ending <laughs> well I, I mean it thinking about it not in the context of that theme I agree. I'm not a massive fan of that happily ever after. If the film, if that's not what the film is about, the film is a very depressing film. <laughs> I don't think it needs a happy ending. In fact, I quite like jarring endings sometimes when they're just gone. I mean, I'm not talking about Sopranos fade to black and nobody gets to, you know, um, gets the satisfaction. But I mean, what else do we need? He, They die. Do we need to know that they've gone to a better place? Or are we allowed to question whether they've gone to a better place? You know, walking into the light uh, is can be sort of quite cheesy. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes people die and that's it. And that's it. And I think that would also have been a really good ending personally. But I do understand why people might think, no, we need, we need to know. You know, we need to know what happens afterwards. Um, but that is really interesting interesting that their first thought was beta black or cut yeah, to black, may- done yeah maybe uh, young harry potter fans weren't ready to see him die in a movie die that yeah that quickly like that, yeah if he can yeah. walk away into the light maybe he's um <laughs> <laughs> he's happy yeah <laughs> Yeah, so uh, here's, here's, here's another one for you. So Hammer Films, which was a, a British film production company responsible for this adaptation of The Woman in Black, were established in the 1930s. And throughout the 50s, they released some iconic horror movies, such as The Curse of Frankenstein in 57, starring Peter yeah. Cushing as Frankenstein, uh, Dracula in 1958, uh, again, Cushing as Van Helsing, and uh, Christopher Lee as Dracula. And, and then the next year... They did The Mummy with uh, Cushing and Lee again. But throughout the 70s, uh, they struggled to keep a good footing in the movie industry, especially facing stiff competition from American horror movies of the 70s. And then sadly, they you know finally shut their doors in 1979. However, in 2007, the Hammer brand was resurrected. And in a twist of fate, The Woman in Black opened with a box office of around $20 million. Wow. Which was the largest opening in Hammer history, which is great. And that's the kind of happy ending I prefer. And thankfully, the film was well received and uh, critically and financially. And uh, well, it did well enough to warrant a sequel. And uh, personally, I do wonder how much of that was down to uh, Daniel Radcliffe's star power alone. Yeah, it's it's true, because I do remember people saying, oh, you should watch this film. It's Harry Potter, not Harry Potter, you know, Um <laughs> We get to see him not as that character. I think it's um, it's quite nice to think that Hammer did these really classic films, Dracula, Frankenstein, The Mummy, and then they do A Victorian Ghost. You know, it's the same kind of, they go for very, they seem to go for very classic horror tropes. And I'm glad that that survived, even though there was a, a, a hiatus. Are they still around today, Hammer? Um, I believe so, but I think they're... Uh, they're- productions have slowed down somewhat yeah I, I i can't help feeling that maybe uh the woman in black was the the, the peak <laughs> yeah it was their almost last hurrah kind of yeah yeah and yes and that's all i've got to share 
for uh, for movie trivia this uh, this week or this month. That's, thank you. That I mean, that's so interesting. Um, I feel like sometimes I get so caught up in the metaphorical reasons why this film is more than it is that I forget that it is still a film and really interesting things happen because it's a film. Um, you know, like the sets and the people who play the characters and the um, production company. I think it's um, it's always nice to learn about those sort of things. Oh, absolutely. And uh, hearing your discussion, well, hearing your talk about the themes has actually changed one of my opinions about the end of the movie. So, <laughs> so thank you for that. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, they could have never thought of that. They could have never thought about the fact that the woman in black could be a representation of emotion. But I'd like to think that they did. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that makes yeah. the ending make a little bit more sense. <laughs> <laughs> we hope you enjoyed this month's Fright Fix. Join us next month as we'll explore a new horror film. We will be posting the movie a few days before the podcast episode is released on our social media. So be sure to follow us at Fright Fix if you want to watch the film ahead of time. If you would like to send us a message or want us to cover a scary movie on an upcoming episode, please feel free to contact us on Instagram or Twitter or email us at podcast at frightfix.com. See you next time. <laughs>